Um, so as Marcy said, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the San Miguel County Baseline Radionuclide Study. Um, the primary authors, um, there's many other people involved, but uh, the primary authors for this report are myself, um, Dr. Mark Williams, uh, Marcy at MSI, and then Mike Weirman and Bob Duraski, who both work for the EPA. Mike's now retired, but um, still involved. Um, so we just heard a little bit about what radionuclides are. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over this again. Um, and the context is a little bit different because um, I'm looking more at what are radionuclides in terms of wa drinking water um, and as that being the medium uh, that we're talking about here. So a radionuclide uh, is a radioisotope or radioactive isotopes. Um, there's basically two types of radiation from radionuclides. You can think about ionizing radiation, which damages uh, living tissues and can increase risks such as cancer, um, congenital defects, and toxicity. Um, and there's also, this kind of includes alpha radiation, as was talked about earlier, uranium, radium-226, beta, uh, which is the radium, tritium, uh, and then also man-made sources. And that's, I put an asterisk there, because um, that's pretty important. Uh, in the bigger picture of things. Um, when I say man-made sources, there's a whole variety. We could be talking about nuclear weapons testing. Uh, we could be talking about um, coal-fired power plants. We could be talking about biomedical technologies. Um, there's a lot of different ways that uh, radionuclides can kind of be produced and also potentially released um, into you know, our surroundings. So um, understanding those and being able to separate those sources versus, say, a source from a particular mine or mill uh, is very important when we're trying to look at uh, values uh, and, and thing, impacts from a certain area or a certain target. Um, and then there's some non-ionizing forms talked about as uh, microwaves and radio waves. Um, so how do we measure radiation? Um, just briefly, some units. Uh, the Curie is a unit for measuring activity of a given uh, radioactive sample. Um, and it's equivalent to the activity of one gram of radium, so that's kind of like your standard. Um, and just as an idea, it's three um, times 10 to the 10th nucleotide Ks per second. Um, this isn't really important, it's just kind of some overview if you're interested. Uh, and Pico Curie is one trillionth um, of a Curie, and data provided by the EPA generally reported as Pico Curies per liter. Um, and you also will hear me talking about uh, micrograms per liter. So micrograms per liter and picocuries per liter can be easily converted. Um, so just kind of some brief numbers just to get an idea. Um, regulatory standards for drinking water. Um, when we're talking about different types of emitters, um, we're talking about picocuries per liter. Um, really the only thing I want you to look at here and just kind of as ballpark is when you're talking uranium. Um, the standard is generally 30 micrograms per liter. Um, CDPHE has set a goal of actually half of that, um, of 16.8 for the um, San Miguel watershed, uh, which is uh, you know, really encouraging. So uh, just, just as you get an idea of where we're talking about in numbers. Um, so regulation 35 is Gunnison Lower Dolores. And as I said, um, we're talking about that uh, range of 16 to 30 uh, micrograms a liter or naturally occurring concentrations as determined by the state of Colorado, whichever is greater. Uh, when you talk about naturally occurring concentrations, how much data do we have on that? Uh, not a lot. That's why we're doing that. Uh, part of why we're taking some measurements now. So we have an idea of what naturally occurring concentrations are in groundwater or in surface water lakes or in soils um, in the area. <coughs> So what's the motivation for this study? Um, obviously, uh, everybody's pretty aware. You've been on a field trip. Uh, everybody in this room knows. So it kind of was spurred by the um, initiation of the radioactive materials license um, for the Pinion Ridge Mill uh, in Paradox Valley. And the timing of that uh, is roughly, you know, give or take the last 10 years is kind of when that's kind of come into play. I'm not going to go into the details of months and years. but. Um, Basically, because of uh, that progress, uh, local stakeholders, which, um, as Marcy said, San Miguel County, town of Ofer, town of Telluride, uh, were concerned that there could be aeolian transport and deposition of dust um, from milling and mining operations um, in the area that could degrade water and air quality in eastern San Miguel County. So, um, 
Basically, this study was initiated um, because we want to have some credible scientific data to provide benchmark for future evaluation of changes from current. You can't make any assumptions if you don't have anything to compare to for data. Um, and so I like to think of this as being proactive as opposed to reactive. Um, we can always react to situations, but if, we have, if we're proactive and we take necessary information ahead of time, then we have something to go on. We're not just uh, waving our arms and saying, we found this and it's because of this. Um, you gotta have something to go back on. Um, and also, really important, I think, theme of this whole conference is obtaining knowledge for the bigger picture. Um, we wanna have an understanding of the entire watershed, the entire airshed, which I'll talk about, um, and what are the different players. It's not just uranium mining. As I said, there's other man-made things. There's coal-fired power plants in the Four Corners region. There's a lot of different things that we want to be aware of um, and have an idea of uh, when we, you know, as we move forward so we're an informed group of people making decisions. So the specifics, um, baseline study um, to establish historic impacts using isotopic ratios of uranium-238 to K-chain and other heavy metals. Um, metals, heavy metals. Uh, and then any future impacts from the new mill and mines could be observed by comparing the unique radiological signature and chemical signature of the ores processed at any particular site in relative to the baseline data in another area. So uh, the key here is that we're taking metals and radionuclides because in any given geologic location, the uranium ore uh, and the host parent material is also going to have a unique metal signature. And so when you get ratios of the metals with the radionuclides, you can actually better fingerprint where something's coming from. So just having um, uranium-238, you know, we don't know, did that come from Utah, did that come from China? We don't know, but we can track that if we have a better fingerprint of the host material. So the basics, uh, what do we know and what do we need to know? So let's, let's start from the beginning. We know San Miguel County has a diverse and highly mineralized geologic makeup, right? That's the background. That has nothing to do with any human activity that was here long before we were. So that's something to keep in perspective. Um, the other things are there's obviously a legacy of past mining across the landscape. Uh, field trip brought that together yesterday, right? We're talking headwaters. We're talking western end of the county. So it's all across the board from hard rock mining, uh, you know, opening up pathways above us and uh, uranium activities happening, you know, uh, downstream, but um, also upwind, so to speak. Um, and then future mining, I'm just going to say it's in the works because I'm not here to tell you when or what's going to happen, but there's, pr there's, there's, there's progress, um, there's reason to be um, aware of it. And the big thing that I want to point out here is that we've had, we had a, you know, a period of intense mining, hard rock mining and uranium mining that happened on, the, say, the first half to middle of the last century. And then the last several decades, you could, you could make an argument that we've kind of had at lower levels of mining, right? So we've had a, somewhat of a period of not a lot of new activity happening. Um, and so we're in this window right now where we can say, okay, maybe things are fairly stable, our airshed, our watershed stable, this is a good time to take measurements. Take measurements now, we also need to do it before any new activity starts because if there was milling going on now, we couldn't take a baseline, right? Because it could be changing between my sample today and my sample at the end of the summer. So that's kind of a good idea of why we're doing it now. So some of the unknowns. Um, what we want to know is what are the current concentrations of radionuclides and associated metals in water and air? Um, and asterisk again, can we define a, um, and sample an air shed, right? So watersheds, we all get, right? Water starts up high, goes down low. Um, but what is an air shed? Air transports uh, particulates um, and different things across our landscape. And what we don't necessarily know, and when we, thought, when we think about mining and monitoring um, like energy sites, usually there's a uh, radius in which you're looking at things. So you might monitor groundwater next to the site. You might water, <laughs> monitor the river for a certain period downstream, right? But also, when you think about air, that shed could get a lot larger. Um, and so what is that? And can we actually, do we have analytical capabilities to identify that? Um, 
So how do the current and future conditions impact human health and the ability to address outside perceptions? So human health, we've gone over that. Um, and the outside perceptions, um, I kind of wanted to choose some verbiage that you know, wasn't too specific, but more or less, this is a tourism-based economy here in Telluride, right? So uh, a, lot of, you know, a lot of the economics in this part of the watershed relies on you know, people coming in because of this beautiful landscape, because of the skiing and things like that. And so if someone comes to us and says, well, that's, that, that dirty snow I'm skiing on, does that, does that have radiation in it? Am I going to get sick? You know, I mean, you never know what the questions are going to be. The more informed we are, the better able we are to answer a question like that. So, oops, I'm back. So just the way to think of it, establishment of reproducible methods, uh, acquisition of valuable information, and that leads to an informed community. Um, so briefly, we already covered this. Who's involved, just to understand the structure. Local governments brought the issue to the table, went to Mountain Studies Institute. Mountain Studies Institute's basically responsible for design, sampling, and reporting of this project. They also branched out to the University of Colorado and, and INSTAR, which is where I work. Um, we developed methods, sample preparation, and analysis of isotopes, um, and synthesis of results. And then the important part here is the EPA is involved simply because they provided analytical analysis. So in no way are they influencing you know, what, were, what are the results of the study, why we're doing the study. They just simply said we can provide these analyses. Metals in Golden, Colorado, radionuclides are at the National um, Lab, which is in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, methods, so what are we sampling? Air, water, and snow. When? Three-year study, 2012 to 14. Air continuously sampled. Uh, water is sampled quarterly to capture seasonality, and snow was annually at maximum accumulation. Um, so sites, though, this is uh, the site map, uh, San Miguel County. The red, I just, uh, I'm going to highlight them for you so you can see a little bit better. We have air, snow, groundwater, and surface water samples, and we tried to get a good spatial distribution of the upper watershed, um, and also with limitations of accessibility. Um, so we had a number of surface water samples that were from drinking water sources, also uh, headwater reaches of the San Miguel, and downstream, furthest downstream is Placerville. So basically we're looking at the watershed up, upstream of Placerville, not including Leopard. Uh, groundwater, we had three wells, and I'll go into that next, I think. So um, talk about air. Briefly, uh, there's an atmospheric dust monitoring network, so we kind of chimed in on this. That's, uh, chaired by Dr. Jason Neff at CU Boulder. Um, Dave Schneck for the county is uh, also very involved with this. And basically this was to establish a geographically distributed long-term record of total uh, particulate loads in Colorado. So you can see the yellow is the number of sites. And this is the Telluride site, which is at the Mill Creek um, water plant. And basically, the device you see there is a continuously running air filter. And there's filters on it. It sucks air in. Every month, those filters are taken. They go to the University of Colorado. They get digested. They get analyzed. Um, and uh, basically, what we can do is we can digest this, these filters, look at particulates in them by mass spec. We can get elemental composition of the dust. Uh, and we're also working on seeing if I can get enough mass from this to actually do isotopic composition of individual elements. That's a challenge um, to analyze radionuclides. The U-series, um, the EPA prefers 400 grams of mass. Um, as you'll see in my snow sampling, we've reduced that to be able to test with 40 grams. But dust filters, uh, we're talking like five years of composites to even get close to that number right now. Um, surface water samples, uh, drinking water sources, Waterfall Creek um, for town of Ophir, Mill Creek in Telluride, and then Blue Lake. Blake. Um, headwaters, San Miguel above Bear Creek, which is this spot here at the toe of the Idorado tailings. Uh, Howard Fork at Ophir, Lake Fork at San Bernardo, Ilium, which is confluence of South Fork, uh, Placerville, as I said, downstream. Um, and now, I'm just going to show you a few pictures. So this is Waterfall Creek intake in Ophir, just to give you an idea. Um, this is Mill Creek in Telluride, where the intake is. That's also where the dust collector is. Uh, probably the most beautiful sampling site that we get to go to is Blue Lake, uh, up above Bridalville Falls, uh, which is a new, it's going to be a new source of water for Telluride. Um, and so just you know, briefly, 
sample collection. Um, uh, every time we collect samples, we're collecting four liters of water for radionuclide analysis, 500 milliliters for metals. We have to filter the water on site and then acidify it for metal sampling. And I also do isotope, stable isotope analysis, which is a smaller sample, uh, and number of different places. Can anybody guess what the picture is on the right, where that is? Howard Fork, Ofer Turn. Good guess. Uh, groundwater wells, uh, we selected three wells based on what we could get. The Wolf, Dave Wolf's well is a domestic well in Ophir. It's a bedrock aquifer um, in um, volcanic bedrock. Uh, the Grundy well is in Ames, which is an alluvial aquifer. Pretty deep, though, so separated from the surface. Town of Telluride Park irrigation well is also an alluvial aquifer. Uh, again, the water is coming from 60 to 80 feet down, so... It's separated from the surface waters, just to get an idea, because we want to know what is the groundwater signal here in this area, um, both in alluvial areas and in bedrock areas. A um, couple of interesting things. Town Park Well, this was actually installed in 77 as a potential drinking water source, um, and there's water quality data all the way back to then. So all of a sudden, now we have an additional baseline that we kind of pulled up, so we have information. Uh, one thing of note um, is that there's there was at high levels of chromium um, in the water, so they turned that well away from being drinking water. Now it's an irrigation well for the park. Um, in the 70s, just as an idea, there was 40 or 50 micrograms a liter. Now we're down to 10. So we actually have, because of a baseline before, we can see how things have changed. And this is probably has nothing to do with the talk, really, but the hexavalent chromium was used um, at Iderado, and so that's likely the source. But just to give you an idea, Doing this study, we actually got additional information about something else and how things have improved over time. Right, we have five minutes. Okay. Um, snow. snow sampling conducted at the end of April to represent maximum accumulation of snowpack and dust. Um, dust storms vary year to year, but we've timed it. Usually it's been about April 25th in the three years of the study. Uh, and we look at both liquid snow from melting an entire snow core and also solids, um, the dust in the snow. So some pictures of sampling. Uh, we go out, dig, uh, dig snow pits, find the dust layers, identify them. Uh, we're also quantifying the area that we're collecting from so that we can do um, distribution over time. We can look at loading um, uh, over the landscape. Um, and this is Prospect Basin. So our three sites were Prospect Basin, which is ski area. Uh, we sampled Ofer Pass, and we also um, sampled Lizard Head. So accessible points in April at high elevations is somewhat limited. Uh, ski and golf, uh, special thanks to Jeff Proto, um, because he enabled us to have some snowmobiles, so we didn't have to carry these out by hand. Uh, for reference, we're talking several thousand pounds of snow at each site each year. 24 of those coolers. Yeah, we had 24 of those large coolers the first year. Um, so this is Ofer Pass sampling. Uh, we were able to get up to the top of the pass from the Silverton side and just crossed over, so we were actually in the right watershed, and take samples and then drag them back down the other side. So that's uh, Anthony Culpepper's in the picture. He, was, uh, he helped out a lot on that one. Uh, and then Lizard Head is obviously accessible from the highway, um, so that would be the headwaters of the Lake Fork. Uh, and this is just some more pictures of sampling, isolating, collecting the dust um, layers, and bringing them back. Um, so snow hauling, uh, fill up the coolers. They're probably 150 pounds each. Put them on a sled and hike. Um, so anybody, there's several people in this room who have done this, and so they know it's, uh, it's, it's hard work. <laughs> um, it's a whole lot of snow. So this is back at the lab in Boulder. Um, and so 1,000 pounds of snow goes into a freeze dryer, and what do you think comes out? Anybody guess? 40 grams of dust. So we're talking a vial this big of dust out of 1,000 pounds. Uh, it takes nine months to freeze dry that much, but this is a new method, new technology. We actually did it. You know, The first year, we actually had trouble getting enough mass. And so we modified our sampling techniques to kind of get higher concentrations of dust and bring down the volume. So just that, that gives you perspective on getting this accomplished. Um, so analysis, real briefly, I'm not going to go into results because 
uh, we're still waiting on the final results and it has to be approved by the folks that um, put this project on before I can talk about all of it. Um, but basically we looked at stable isotopes to identify the sources, pathways, and seasonality of the samples. We looked at radionuclides, uranium, thorium, radium series, um, which are the contaminants of concern, and then metals, the standard EPA suite is sufficient to give us the metals that we want. Uh, and as I said before, that's source fingerprinting when you combine the metals with the radionuclides from a particular source. Um, and, and as a bonus, you get standalone metals data, which can go into larger databases, uh, which are important for across the watershed. Uh, I'm going to skip that. So just some basic results uh, with the stable isotopes, because this isn't you know, pertinent to the study, just to show you what we can do. So what we're looking at is the concentration of oxygen-18 in water on the uh, x-axis. And all you need to know is that snow is very depleted. The top corner uh, generally is around minus 20, whereas rain has a signal around 5 to 10. And so what this tells you is all of our sources are, are well mixed, and they're closer to snow than rain. So it just gives you an idea to start with, most of the water, groundwater or surface water here, is originating as snow, which makes sense. Snow is the dominant precip uh, input. But that just gives you an idea of how we can use isotopes. Um, another way we can look at it is the concentration of the isotopes in every sample through time. So this is 2012 to 2014. And all you need to know is it varies depending on if you sample in the spring at snowmelt runoff or in base flow. Um, and the only exception to that is um, if you look at this line here, this is the groundwater from the bedrock well. That source is so well mixed that we're not getting a seasonality change. So I think that's just about it. Um, I'll s so this is total strontium co concentrations. Um, and this also gives you an idea. Um, there's, you look at isotope ratios, but just so you can have an idea, these are surface waters and these are groundwaters. So concentrations of strontium is also something that you can separate by source um, based on their contact time with uh, parent material. Okay, so summarize the results that I can't really talk about. Data set is 95% complete, pending the 2014 dust and snow, which were sent to NREL in December. As I told you, it takes nine months to freeze dry. Then it takes several months to analyze. Um, so the, sh the best part is, yes, the techniques worked. Uh, we have gotten good data from all the sources we sampled, and we've improved our methodology to do this in the future. Um, I can tell you there's no need for alarm. Um, we're nowhere near that 16 mark. Uh, for the uranium concentrations. So uh, as I said, it's still preliminary data, so I can't go into the details, uh, but that's good to know. And we do have trusty values um, that are pretty consistent year to year uh, for the other sources. And we have a much improved understanding of can we sample uh, air sheds? Uh, can we actually get valuable information from dust and snow, uh, which is yes. And um, some of the other things is that I think we're finding that there is, the dust may be unique um, in a signature relative to what's on the ground, which is also telling us that the dust is coming from at least a little ways away. Um, so, I, you know, as I said, I can't go into a ton of detail there, but that's really encouraging information because we may be able to track air sheds via this dust method. Um, so I will acknowledgements, a long list of people um, that helped out, and there's probably many more. But it was a collaborative effort, as I said, and I will uh, leave it at that for questions. Thanks.